Hi, and thank you for joining us right here at Prostate Cancer Live. My name is Todd Hartley, and I'm coming to you from Scottsdale, Arizona, and I'm joined by our medical director, Doc RBT, Rich Bevan Thomas, from the Dallas Fort Worth area. Hi, Doc RBT. Hey, Todd, how are you? Thanks, uh, thanks for putting this on tonight. It's awesome. It's a great opportunity for us. You know, what we're doing on this platform with Prostate Cancer Live is we're checking in with leading experts, and, uh, and Doc BT is going to be answering some questions tonight. If you'd like to submit in a question, by all means, you can do that at, at uh, prostatecancerlive.com. And, and so tonight's event is going to be dedicated purely to answering the essential questions, you know, the most important questions that a newly diagnosed patient should talk to their doctor about. So let's get started. Um, what is my Gleason score? Is that one of those important? What is my Gleason score, my PSA level, and my tumor stage? Would that be one of those essential questions? Yeah, Todd, it is. Okay, so the first thing that we talk about with patients is, again, when somebody gets diagnosed with prostate cancer, and we talked about this last and a couple of weeks ago, was the fact that they actually get a, what's called a Gleason grade and, of course, a Gleason score. So, again, just to kind of just put that in just a couple of sentences, when somebody gets diagnosed with adenocarcinoma, which is the most common, you know, kind of prostate cancer that we see, you will then get a Gleason grade. And that grade is going to be two numbers together, right? So, again, we really only have, it's two numbers together. It's a scale of one through five plus one through five. Again, we throw out the ones or twos because we rarely ever see those. So then we get those numbers. So, really, it's going to be three, four, and five plus a three, four, and five. Okay, why is that important? We get that Gleason score, again, the numbers together, and that is actually very helpful in terms of whether we classify patients. And again, in a couple of weeks, we're going to go over in more detail about how we classify patients in terms of what we call the NCCN guidelines. And that's a really lengthy discussion. But at the end of the day, the Gleason score, whether that's going to be a 6, 7, or 8, 9, or 10, really lets us know how aggressive that cancer is and really where we're going to go next in terms of what we would recommend for that patient. All right, so you mentioned uh, a big word. I don't know what it is. My job is to make sure that this whole interview happens on a layperson level. So uh, what is an adenocarcinoma? You just mentioned it a moment ago. Can you explain that to me? Right, so an adenocarcinoma is a type of cancer that actually develops from specific gland, the specific gland of the prostate cancer, of the prostate cells themselves. And again, because, you know, roughly about 99% of, actually, actually over 99% of cancer within the prostate actually comes from these specific cells, and that's called an adenocarcinoma. You can get much rarer cancers within the prostate called a small cell carcinoma. You can also get cancer cells that are basically a type of either a bladder cell or bladder carcinoma that invades into the prostate. But for all intents and purposes, you know, and again, almost all patients, and again, with a few exceptions, actually have what's called an adenocarcinoma. And again, and that actually breaks down into the Gleason grade. And that's actually very important because, again, that Gleason grade and that Gleason score, and that's what everybody talks about. When everybody comes to our clinic or, you know, and talks about their, their, their cancer, they say, well, what was your Gleason score? And it's very, very important because, again, the lower the score, the lower grade, you have actually in that cancer, and as a whole, those tend to be actually slower growing cancers. The higher the score, i.e. an 8, 9, or a 10, the higher the grade of those cancers, the higher the grade of those cancers, unfortunately those tend to grow um, at a much higher rate. And as a result, that is the first thing that we start with when we talk to patients about their prostate cancer. All right, so that's the first thing. What's the second thing? And, and is that an essential question? Like, is the second thing... Do I have a very low risk, a low to intermediate risk, or a high risk? What's, what, what am I supposed to be asking next? Right. So a couple of things that we look at. You know, again, number one is that, that, that grade or that score that we have for that patient. That's number one. Number two we're going to look at is that PSA. So that blood test score, or the, the blood test, not a score, it's, it's a number is what it is. But that number is actually very important because similar to the Gleason score, the higher that PSA, it does portend the fact that there is a higher risk that there's either, that cancer is either growing 
at a rapid rate potentially in the prostate or gets outside of the prostate. So if we see a patient with a Gleason grade or Gleason score of 6 and the PSA is below 10, again, that patient is going to be in a lower risk category. However, if we see a patient, let's for example, with a Gleason, a Gleason score of 7 but their PSA is 17, that patient then has a higher risk category because everything we do in prostate cancer is all about classifying those patients and trying to figure out where do we go next. And what's happened over the last 10 years is really, again, is this a cancer that we can follow or is this a cancer that we need to treat? So again, let's go over that. Number one is the Gleason grade or the score that you have. Okay, grade, grade do those two numbers together and your score. So is it a 6, 7, or an 8, 9, or 10? Second thing, again, is your PSA. And a third, which, which is part of this, which I think is also extremely important, is the volume of disease. Okay, so in other words, you could have a very small amount of a Gleason 6 prostate cancer, or you could have a very large amount of cancer, and that actually would classify you in a different category. So volume, grade, and again, that PSA score. Mm -hmm. All right, so where do I go now? Um, if I'm a, a smart patient and I'm meeting with my, my uh, you know, prostate cancer doctor, what's the next most important question that I should be asking? Well, the next most important question is, is we look at all those parameters. And what I always tell patients, which is really the next question, is what am I classified as? You know, in other words, we, we've got to sort of start from the beginning here, is that we put all those numbers together and we say, okay, am I a very low risk, am I low risk, am I intermediate, and am I high risk? And without going into too much detail, we take all of those factors that we just discussed, and then we come up with that risk stratification. And again, that goes into the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines that we have. And that's particularly important. And why that's so important is because, again, there are so many ways in which we can treat prostate cancer. And it just so happens that one of the ways in which we treat prostate cancer is we actually don't treat prostate cancer. We follow those patients very, very carefully. So with that said, it's important to know which category that you're in. That's really the, that's, I would say that's one of the first things that I discuss with my patients because it really dictates how the next part of that conversation goes. Because for patients that actually have a higher grade cancer, okay, or with a PSA that's above 10, in other words, a high PSA, for those patients, we really bypass. We mentioned the fact that there are some patients that we follow their cancer and potentially what we call active surveillance, but for those patients, almost invariably, it is not a good idea that we do that. So we bypass that part of the discussion and we go right into the discussion of what is the most appropriate way in which I can treat this cancer. Okay, so if, if I understand correctly, some prostate cancers don't need to be cut out, they don't need to be treated, or uh, a patient doesn't need some type of chemotherapy. Explain that. I know you touched on it, right. but I want to explain it so somebody who's new to this now has like a, a, you know, a practical conversation where they can get up to speed. Great. Great question on that. And the bottom line on this is that Yes, and it sounds absolutely crazy, and we've been doing this for a number of years, and it's really become much more commonplace over the last five years. But what we found out in the world of prostate cancer, and we've known this for a time, but we actually feel more comfortable with it now, is that if a patient actually has a lower grade, okay, or a lower score, which is a Gleason 6, okay, prostate cancer, in other words, it's a 3 plus 3, okay, and for all intents and purposes, they've got a lower volume on that, for those patients their chances that that cancer is going to grow at a faster rate, meaning that it can get outside of the prostate, get beyond the prostate to the lymph nodes and to the bones, is routinely relatively slow. Okay, so in other words, it, that is a potential cancer that we can follow. Okay, so let me kind of explain this. So it sounds crazy. When I mention this to patients, you know, and routinely it's the wives that look at me and go, let me just get this right. So you're telling me my husband's got cancer and we don't need to treat it. And the answer to that is maybe, okay? And that's why I, you know, we have to explain this in more detail, is because with these lower grade cancers, we need to find out, number one, is that we, we always have to explain the fact that when we do a biopsy, okay, we are only sampling the prostate, okay? So there is always the chance, and it's somewhere in the ballpark of around a 20% chance that there may be another focus of cancer in there. And it could be a little bit higher, could be a little bit lower, but give or take, it's about a one in five that there could be more cancer, right? 
So we do a biopsy on a patient, and there is the risk that we could have missed one of those intermediate or higher grade cancers. So for patients that we find these lower grade, i.e. Gleason 6, and lower volume cancers, okay, let's say for argument's sake, maybe it's maybe two or three cores, a relatively small amount, okay, for those patients, we can follow them, and we follow them very closely. We don't forget about those patients. And that's kind of another discussion. But at the end of the day, an active surveillance means we follow them, which means that we will then say, okay, Mr. Jones, you've got a low-grade prostate cancer. Your PSA is quite low, you know, for the most part. And then we say, we're going to follow you closely. We're going to make sure that we're not seeing your PSA rise up at an exponential rate. So we want to make sure, again, and there's different guidelines for this, the ones we use at USMD are very, very similar to the, to the National Comprehensive Cancer Guidelines, NCCN Network guidelines that we're going to discuss in the next couple of weeks. But at the end of the day, what we do is we have to make sure that we or minimize the chance that we're missing another higher grade or a higher volume of cancer. So it means we're following the PSA. Routinely, we do that every three to six months. And we're also repeating biopsies. So for those patients, yes, I tell to Mr. Jones's wife, I say, yes, it's an option for us. We can follow that cancer, but we don't forget about them. We're going to be repeating biopsies at a sequential rate, routinely every one to two years, you know, and you know, for a specific period of time, to make sure that he continues to remain a good candidate. And we think that the chances of him having a higher grade or a higher volume cancer are low, and we can follow this cancer for at least a period of time. All right. So, is active surveillance um, the result of maybe generations of over treating prostate cancer patients that didn't need such aggressive treatment? You know, it's a great question, and this is what we're finding out now. There's, we're, we're finding out more and more on active surveillance. I think we have to approach this very, very cautiously, and, and here's the reason why, is that to answer your question, um, is it related to the fact that we probably over-treated patients? And the answer is, yeah, I think that's part of it. I think what we found is that we have found that, you know, over the last, you know, 20 or 30 years that, yes, we have had these patients with these low-grade, low-volume cancers that, and now we're asking ourselves as surgeons, did we need to treat these patients to begin with? And the answer is, maybe, maybe not. And that's the problem is we don't have all the answers right now. There is this sweet spot that everybody's looking for. We don't want to over-treat prostate cancer. So in other words, we don't want to do surgery on everybody. But then again, the problem with prostate cancer is that if that cancer gets outside of the prostate and if it gets to the lymph nodes and if it gets beyond, those patients are far more difficult to treat. And, some, and I would say a majority of those patients, unfortunately, we can't cure them. So we can cure those patients if we get them early enough. But again, we don't want to overtreat, And so this is where we're working on now is what is that sweet spot? How do we find those patients with these lower grade, lower volume cancers so we don't necessarily need to treat, at least immediately? Okay, so I find it interesting. It sounds like, you know, there's in, in cancer treatment in general, we're in this phase of learning that it's not one size fits all in treatment anymore. And from what you're telling me, the same smart science and approach is happening in prostate cancer. So it is, and that's really what's evolving. And so, you know, similar to, you know, breast cancer and a lot of other malignancies out there, what's happening with prostate cancer is we're now trying to go down into the depths of what's happening with these cells. Yes, we know that if we look at a Gleason 6 or a 3 plus 3 prostate cancer, that a majority of those cancers actually are going to behave like your average Gleason 6 slower grade prostate cancer. But there are several tests that we can use out there that actually give us a little bit more detail in terms of what the genetics look like for those cancer cells. Okay, so an example of that is Oncotype DX, which is a specific test that actually looks at the genetic structure of those cells. And what that test does is it will then look at those at the genetic structure of those cells and it lets us know what is the likelihood that these cancer and the cancer that we have at least on that particular patient what is the chances that that cancer is going to again behave like one of those lower grade slow growing cells cancer cells or what is the chance it could behave like a higher growing cells like a Gleason 7 and that gives us more information you know for a number of patients you know it, it is an excellent option to give us one more data point to say Mr. Jones, 
you've got a Gleason 6 prostate cancer. Here's what we've got from the Gleason 6. Here's what we've got from the volume. Here's what we've got from your biopsy. Here's what we've got from your PSA. But we can get another bit of information that lets us know, okay, we're now getting a genetic evaluation of these cancers. And again, it looks like, from a genetic perspective, that this should behave like a lower grade cancer. And as a result, it gives us more information. And we do, we do see, but it's an early test. And I think the data is certainly encouraging. And this is what's happening with prostate cancer is Oncotype is one of the tests out there that's giving that information about the ge genetics of these cancer cells and, and helping us, again, you know, make those specific decisions. All right, Doc BT, how big is the prostate gland? And, um, and then how does the whole biopsy process happen? Right, so it's a great question, and you know, I have patients say this all the time. Is you know, I tell them that you know their prostate is you know the average size prostate. So let's look at let's for for average. You know, the average size prostate. This whole idea that the prostate is the size of a walnut. I mean, I don't know if they've got walnuts on you know like Miracle Grow or something, but the but the bottom line is that most prostates are far bigger than a walnut. You know, on average, they're about. You know, they're about a golf ball or maybe two golf balls that you put together. I mean, that's the average size prostate. But what happens is, is that as men get older, that prostate tends to grow in size. And that's just from a hormonal influence and the prostate, those cells actually start just growing. Okay. And as those cells grow, that prostate actually grows in size. And this is a normal thing. But some men, their prostate size actually just increases at a faster rate than some of the other men. So on average, you know, give or take, so we'll take an average guy in his 60s, the average size you know, is again, somewhere in the ballpark of around, if you look at a golf ball or maybe a golf ball and a half or something along those lines, maybe two golf balls, and you put them together, you know, that's sort of what, that's the size of that prostate. It's certainly not the size of the walnut, at least the walnuts that I've seen. And anyway, that's the size of this thing. And again, when we do the rectal exam, we're feeling that prostate, but we can only feel just the bottom side, you know, what's called the posterior aspect, the bottom side of that prostate. So we can't feel the entire prostate. And again, that's some of the limitations that we have just on physical exams. Mm -hmm. So when you actually physically examine a prostate, you're only getting maybe uh, a quarter or even less than a quarter yeah, in physical field. Well, you know, again, so it depends on a couple of things. You know, um, you know, I'm six two, so if you come into my office, I'm probably going to feel your prostate. But I have some partners that are five two with tiny little fingers. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, like, it's pretty tough, you know, for them to actually feel the entire prostate. So uh, there's a lot of different variables, you know, involved in that. The bottom line on that is that, yeah, we're not feeling the entire prostate. It gives us an example or gives us a sample of what's potentially happening there. But, you know, primarily prostate cancer is actually going on the outside of the prostate. And that's routinely what we're feeling for is any abnormalities or bumps that may or may not show up in addition to that elevated PSA. All right, so earlier you mentioned about the actual biopsy and that our, I think I heard you say that samples are taken from different places around the prostate. How does that happen? Is that robotic? So it's not. Um, you know, so we, there's, there's multitudes of ways in which we're looking at this now, but let's take a, you know, pretty much the standard way in which we approach this. The standard way in which we approach biopsies, and it's particularly important, we're actually going to do one of these on it, and I'm going to show some videos about this because it's very, very important. So if you talk about what happened to men, you know, let's say 10 or 15 years ago from getting a biopsy, it's different than it is now, and it's primarily as different from a number of different avenues. Part one is the fact that most of us in the urology community will actually do anesthesia around the prostate. Now, we weren't particularly good at it 10, 15 years ago. Some of us thought, you know, it really could help out. But now, now I think most of us who do enough of these biopsies have pretty well mastered this. And what we do, and I'm going to show some videos on this later on down the road, but what we do is we numb up and we inject a little bit of lidocaine just around the prostate so that when we actually put those needles in, you know, and then, again, we numb up the prostate, we have an ultrasound, it's like a rectal exam, that ultrasound actually will take a look at that prostate, right? So after we numb up that prostate, we're taking several pictures of that prostate, and then what we'll do is, the best way to look at this is think about a tennis ball, right? And we cut the tennis ball in half, and then we cut it into thirds, front third, middle third, and back third. But you're not, actually, you're not actually cutting it. We're not cutting it. Now, funny, as an example, I want you to think about those sections. I'm not cutting anything yet. So what we do is we take that and we section it off, at least in our mind's eye, of where you can see this. And then what we do is, again, we, we put it off into sections. 
So you have the front section, which is called the apex, and that's the that's the section that we can first feel when we do the rectal exam. That's the that's the area closest to the anus. And then there's the midsection, and then there's the base, and the base is the area that's that's the part of the prostate that's closest to the bladder. Okay, and that's also the area which is the behind that, which is called the seminal vesicles. Okay, so we've got apex, mid, and base. We've got the right side and the left side, and then we basically in our mind's eye we actually will, will separate that into, into the, what's called the outside, the lateral section, as well as the medial sections. And we also look at what's called the transition zone and the peripheral zone, but I'm not going to get into too much detail on that right now. But the bottom line on this is that what we want to do is we want to make sure that we are taking samples of specific zones of this prostate. When we, after we numb up that prostate, then what we do is we actually take a small little needle, and that needle actually shoots directly in the prostate. But men shouldn't feel this. And if they are feeling this, it means that we just didn't do as good of an anesthetic. And again, you know, in our clinic, it's roughly about 90, 95% of patients say they, they felt a little bit of pressure, but, you know, they hardly felt anything at all. On a scale of 1 to 10, they say maybe it's a 1, maybe a 2 at the most, and hardly any of them feel anything. And it's really important to understand this because... You know, I think, and again, comparing back to your old, you know, like your dad's biopsy, your grandpa's biopsy, people talk about that, is that, you know, I would have patients that would come in to my clinic and would say, I felt like the last biopsy, I just came out of a POW camp. And I would say, look, we're different here, and here's how we're going to do it. And we'll go into detail on that in a future video. But at the end of the day, we numb up around the prostate, needles go directly in the prostate, and we take samples of those areas. And those are specific sections of that prostate. We know that there's areas in the prostate that are actually have a higher risk of having prostate cancer, and those are the areas routinely that will biopsy you know, on those sections. Then what happens is we take those specimens, we send them off to the pathologist, okay, and then that pathologist will read those and then slice them into very, very thin sections. They will then look at that and say, I either did see cancer or I didn't see cancer or I saw some abnormal cells in there. And again, there's a whole host of other pathology diagnoses that we have on that. Make sense? It does. The uh, pathologist then reports back to the surgeon and provides them what? The, uh, the biological makeup of that tumor? Exactly. Or, or if, if, if there is? That's right. That's exactly right. So that's when actually we get the Gleason grade. So patients will come into me with an elevated PSA and they would say, well, what's my Gleason grade? What's my score? And I would say, well, first of all, we don't have a diagnosis of prostate cancer. Hopefully we never get there. But if we do get that, at that point, assuming that it's going to be an adenocarcinoma, which we talked about, it's the most common, that's what we get on prostate cancer, majority. At that point, then they come up with a pathologic diagnosis and a Gleason grade and subsequently a Gleason score for that biopsy. And I always get these questions which I think are very good, which is if I say a patient has a Gleason 6 prostate cancer involving 10%, you know, what I talk about is, is, is it 10% of that one core? And routinely, you know, at USMD, we do 14 cores, unless it's a bigger prostate, then we do either 18 or sometimes we do saturations. But majority of time on those patients that are the average size prostates, we'll do 14 cores in 12 zones. And then they come back in 12 zones, right? So they come back in those 12 zones, and we'll have a percentage of the biopsy specimen that we did, how much of that was cancer. And again, that's important for us, because if we start getting a high volume of cancer, we always worry whether it's going to be a low grade or a high grade, or even an intermediate grade, is how, what is, what are the chances, and if we look at that, if we've got multiple areas of cancers on there and a high volume of cancer, that obviously has a higher risk that, that can get outside of the prostate, and that's a patient routinely we're going to recommend being more aggressive with. Okay, Doc BT, maybe this is the most important question. How do you know if the prostate cancer, if the patient is diagnosed with prostate cancer, how do you know if it's spread to the lymph nodes? So it's a great question, and again, you know, what we do is we look at, you know, everything in life is all about statistics. You know, there's liars, great liars, and there's statisticians. Everybody's heard that line. But actually, the statistics actually on prostate cancer are very, very helpful. So what we do is, again, we take all of those risk categories that we talked about earlier for a patient with, you know, let's say uh, a Gleason 6 with a PSA of 4.1, and there are actually several what's called a nomogram. And a nomogram is a specific, uh, it, it's, it's a... It's, uh, it's a way in which you can input numbers, and then you input your age, you input your Gleason grade, you input how many cores are positive, 
And then what happens is, and the one, you know, a lot of people use either what's called the CAPRA score on that. A lot of people use the Sloan Kettering nomogram, which I particularly favor. I think it's a very good one. And then what we do is we then, it'll give us a percentage of, you know, what are the percentages of the cancer that we had on the biopsy? What is the chances that this thing is outside of the capsule or prostate? What is the chance it's invading the seminal vesicles? What is the chance of invading the lymph nodes? And, you know, again, and then it gives you the chances of, of what is the chance of recurrence of this cancer, you know, in five years and ten years and the chance that patient's going to be alive of that cancer. So it gives you a lot of data points that you can use on that. So it's a long-winded answer that says we look at all of that data to look at the risks that there could be evidence of lymph node involvement on that. The challenge that we have on prostate cancer is it's not as easy as getting a CAT scan and saying, hey, well, look, there you go. There's lymph nodes. And so, you know, you must have cancer in your lymph nodes. Because, unfortunately, the CAT scans and even the MRIs, to a certain respect, are really are not that helpful. A majority of the cancer, unless it's really what we call bulky adenopathy, in other words, big nodes in there, a majority of these cancers, you just can't see very well if they've gone to the lymph nodes. You can't see them on a CAT scan or MRI unless we're talking about advanced disease. All right. So, um, you know, as a uh, husband of a breast cancer survivor, I remember the, the biopsy vividly of my wife's lymph nodes. But right. do you guys do that in, in prostate cancer? So we don't, but it's, it's interesting that you bring this up because it, we're, there's been more of a resurgence lately about lymph nodes. So let's, let's kind of go down memory lane here a little bit. So when I was training we, you know, back in the 90s and you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s, we would actually routinely actually take the lymph nodes, send them off if the patient was at higher risk, send them off to the pathologist, have them do what's called a frozen section. This is while we were doing, you know, open surgery and we'd take the lymph nodes off. It was at high risk. And then that we would wait, you know, 15, 20 minutes and we'd continue doing, but we'd know that if the lymph nodes were positive, almost invariably we would not do the case at that point. We would not do the prostate to the prostatectomy because we knew that doing the prostatectomy was not necessarily going to cure that patient. Well, we've actually found that's actually a little bit different now. Um, and the Europeans have actually been really on the forefront on this, which is the fact that we can't, and again, let's go back to the original point compared to your breast cancer wise, is that is that from a breast cancer wise, you can go in, you sample the lymph nodes, and you get kind of an idea of whether there's cancer in the lymph nodes. For prostate cancer, really the only way that we can sample those lymph nodes is actually by doing a bigger surgery where we actually take out the lymph nodes. Again, going back to you know the 90s, we used to do what's called a lymph node dissection and take those out and get a good idea. But now, really what we do is if a patient is at higher risk or at high or intermediate to high risk, we then try to do is take as many lymph nodes as possible for that patient at the same time that we take the prostate out because we know that for those patients actually we do have cancer in the lymph nodes we can actually potentially cure some of those patients if there's only one or two cancer cells in there. So, long-winded answer. End of the day, it's not as easy as breast cancer. Taking some lymph nodes out, we got to do it while we're doing surgery. Really interesting. Okay, so tonight we learned about a Gleason score, a PSA level, a tumor stage. We learned about a whole lot of, of different elements for uh, you know the newly diagnosed prostate cancer patient. But... Um, you know, Doc BT, if you could grade the job that we've done tonight, A, B, C, D, F, how have we done in, in covering the most important questions that a newly diagnosed patient should ask? Uh, you know, Todd, I'd give you an A, uh, but I'm biased, you know, I'm part of this. So here's the challenge that we have is that it's a pretty complex topic. The problem and the challenges that we have with prostate cancer is, you know, I tell people it's a little bit like, you know, like going to like a buffet. You've got so many things out there. You don't really know, you know, like, well, geez, is the salmon good? You got to, you know, what is the steak or whatever it is. And there's so much information out there. And it's really trying to figure out, you know, for those patients with prostate cancer, like, where do you go next? You know, in other words, do I, you know, I have patients who come in my office that have, you know, really low grade cancer and they walk in and they've already decided that they want a robotic prostatectomy. And the first thing I do is I say, well, let's take a step back and let's make sure that we've evaluated all these options first, okay? And I have the second thing is that I think what we want to do and what we've done tonight is at least give a primer and sort of an intro into what we want those patients to ask their physician and make sure that those patients are actually getting those questions answered because you want to know 
the more you know about the disease, the better off you're going to be. You know, I tell patients, we've got time on our side. We don't have years on our side, but we've definitely got, you know, several weeks, if not, you know, a month or several months or so to make sure we do our homework so that patient understands this. Don't go for the shiny new object. Don't go, oh my God, there's this new therapy and, you know, they're doing it down in, you know, in, in Brazil and that's where I'm going to go because the challenge is, is that this is cancer. We usually have a great best shot the first time we treat that. And so we want to make sure that we are approaching everything with education and with data. And again, we take it in a step-by-step -step fashion. Well, he's our medical director here at Prostate Cancer Live. His name is Rich Bevan Thomas. And on behalf of the full crew at Prostate Cancer Live, we wish you a very healthy, healthy and happy two weeks until we regroup right here at Prostate Cancer Live. Now, um, in two weeks, it's going to be tricky because I'm going to be traveling overseas, but you and I will choreograph how sure. we do this okay. in order to keep the ball rolling. And if anybody would like to submit in questions, now keep in mind, questions all have to be non-case specific. So no personal questions. Because of the sure volume of questions, we're not able to answer all of them. But if you'd like to guide or suggest, by all means, please do. And you could do that on Prostate Cancer Live on the uh, far right side of the page. And we'll look forward to being a part of your education and healing experience. So on behalf of Doc BT and myself, have a wonderful two weeks till we re-engage with you right here at Prostate Cancer Live. Bye, guys.